A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 4th of February 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. It talks about the recent tussle between Delhi chief minister and his lieutenant governor. Due to differences in opinion between the two, weekly meetings between them are not taking place. This is what is given in the news article displayed here. In this context, let us learn about the powers of lieutenant governor in our exam perspective. Now, before seeing the powers of lieutenant governor, let us briefly learn about union territories of India. See, the term union of India can be divided into two categories. One is the state and the other is the union territories. So, what is the difference between a state and an union territory? The main difference between a state and an union territory is that state governments have the exclusionary power to make laws regarding the subjects that are listed under the state list of the 7th schedule. Now this power is not being extended to the union territories. You note that both the union parliament and the union territories with the legislative assembly have concurrent powers of law making in the state list subjects. So this is about the main difference between union territories and states in India. We know that in total 8 union territories are there in India. I have displayed here the 8 union territories and the name of the executive heads of the territories here. You can go through it. Now if you notice the nomenclature of the head of executives are not the same in every union territory. For the UTs of Delhi, Puducherry, Andamana, Nicobar, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, the executive head is called as Lieutenant Governor. While for the other three union territories, the executive head is called as Administrator. Here also note that only Delhi and Puducherry have a legislature of their own, while the other union territories don't have a legislative body of their own. Now coming to Jammu and Kashmir specific information. See, Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, which was passed in the year 2019, provides that the administration of the Jammu and Kashmir will be as per Article 239A of the Indian Constitution. Article 239A was originally formulated for only the Union Territory of Puducherry, but after the amendment of JNK Reorganization Act 2019, Article 239A is now made applicable to Jammu and Kashmir also. Okay? So this is all about the brief background of union territories present in India. Now coming to the administrative details of Delhi. See as I said earlier, Delhi has a legislative body which is headed by a chief minister. It also has an executive head called Lieutenant Governor who is nominated by the union government. Since the Lieutenant Governor is representative of the union, Sometimes there emerges a confrontation between the Lieutenant Governor and the publicly elected CM of Delhi. Normally when we consider states, the Governor who are nominated by the Centre have only certain discretionary powers. But this is not the case with respect to Union territories. Here the Lieutenant Governor are provided with huge powers. This is why conflict emerges between the Lieutenant Governor and the CMs of the Union territories. This scenario is not only particular to Delhi, this was the case with respect to Puducherry as well. When former IPS officer Kiran Bedi was made the Lieutenant Governor of Puducherry, there emerged a constant battle between her and the Puducherry CM of the day. So this is a brief background of the Lieutenant Governor. Now coming to the powers of Lieutenant Governor with respect to Delhi, see we have looked at the article 239A. Now to understand that, we have to look at the article 239A, A, sub clause 4 to understand the power of the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. This particular clause gives Lieutenant Governor the power to refer to President any issue which arises because of a difference of opinion between the Lieutenant Governor and his ministers. If a decision on an urgent issue needed to be taken, then Lieutenant Governor has been provided with the necessary power to take the decision even if the issue is pending before the President. This power is frequently used by the Lieutenant Governor to act against the advice of Council of Ministers of Delhi. Now you have to make note of this because this is an extraordinary power which is granted to the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. 
he can go against the directions of his council of ministers using this particular clause given under the article 239 aa of the indian constitution now the article given in today's newspaper was based on an issue related to sending some primary school teachers of delhi on an educational tour to finland the cm of delhi wants his school teachers to go on with the trip but the lieutenant governor of delhi is questioning the government regarding this particular tour he questioned the government on the cost benefit analysis of the tour he noted that the file for the approval of the tour is pending with the lieutenant governor's office so because of this issue weekly meetings between the lieutenant governor and the delhi cm has been boycotted so this is what is said in this news article so i hope we covered holistically about the powers of lieutenant governor and then we saw specifically about the powers of lieutenant governor with respect to delhi so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about the steps taken in the budget that will aid in india's green energy transition so in this news article discussion let us understand few important points mentioned in the editorial in detail okay see recently an article was published during the world economic forums annual meeting in davos the article stated that india holds the key to achieve global climate change targets now here you might have a question why does india holds the key to achieve not just our but the global climate change targets there are certain reasons for that let us see them one by one see the first reason is the growing population according to recent reports india's population is set to overtake china's population so if a huge country like india cut down emissions then global climate change targets can be easily achieved so this is the first reason the second reason is india's growing energy needs see economically india is one of the fastest growing countries in the world right so to continue on its growth path india needs reliable energy currently the demand for energy is set to grow for india but the issue here is currently fossil fuel is the major contributor to india's energy needs so in the near future if india makes a course correction and switches to renewable sources to satisfy its growing energy needs it will contribute to sustainable growth in india so if india attains sustainable growth it will also go a long way in addressing the climate change crisis that the world is currently facing okay so because of these two reasons it is being said that india holds the key to achieve global climate change targets and india being a responsible country realized the role it has to play in combating global climate change so this is why in cop26 india committed to become carbon neutral by 2070 india has taken various steps to address climate change in the recent budget also india took some steps so now let us see some of the steps taken by india see firstly india has decided to exempt customs duty on the import of capital goods and machinery required to manufacture lithium ion cells but why see in india all the major automobile manufacturers have started rolling out various electronic vehicle models but the uptake of ev in india is still low due to its high cost compared to conventional vehicles now this is again because availability of indigenously produced lithium ion battery is not sufficient so this is why the government has decided to exempt customs duty on the import of capital goods and machinery required to manufacture lithium ion cells so this move of the government will give a boost to domestic manufacture of lithium ion batteries this in turn will make ev cheaper okay so this is the first step taken by government secondly our government has decided to establish a viability gap funding mechanism to support the creation of battery energy storage systems with a capacity of 4000 megawatts now what is the requirement of a battery storage system see india has decided to move towards renewable energy like wind and solar power but the thing about wind and solar power is that they produce variable power that is unlike thermal power plants power production from wind and solar cannot be scaled up and down based on the demand for electricity in case of wind and solar power sometimes they produce more power than the demand 
and sometimes they produce power less than the demand. So we need storage devices to store excess power produced during low demand and supply the stored power when energy demand is high. So to successfully integrate renewable energy into our power grids, we need a battery storage system. But currently the battery storage system in India is very meager. To address this, our government has decided to establish a viability gap funding mechanism to support the creation of battery energy storage systems with a capacity of 4000 megawatts. So this is the second major step taken by our government. Now finally the government has allotted 8300 crore rupees towards setting up an interstate transmission line from Ladakh. See the solar energy production capacity of Ladakh is very high. This is because Ladakh has vast stretches of barren land and one of our country's highest level of sunlight availability. The renewable energy potential of Ladakh is around 13 gigawatts. But right now, there are not many solar power plants in Ladakh. This is because there is not interstate transmission line from Ladakh. So even if power is produced in Ladakh, it cannot be transmitted to our country's main grid. To address this problem, our government has allotted 8,300 crore rupees towards setting up an interstate transmission line from Ladakh. So this will help us to tap Ladakh's solar energy potential. So these are all some of the steps taken by the government that will help India go green and address the climate crisis. So in this news article discussion, we saw in detail about why does India hold the key to achieve the global climate change targets. In that, the first reason is growing population and the second reason is India's growing energy needs. Then we saw about some of the steps taken by our government. Firstly, our government has exempted customs duty on the import of capital goods and machinery required to manufacture lithium-ion cells. We saw that this will make EV cheaper. Secondly, we saw that our government has decided to establish a viability gap funding mechanism to support the creation of battery energy storage systems. And thirdly, we saw that the government has allotted certain rupees towards setting up an interstate transmission line from Ladakh. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. It talks about the military coup in Myanmar. We all know that the military captured power through a coup, right? But it is now struggling to have a grip on the power. A report by the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, which is an independent group of international experts, says that the military has stable control over only 17% of the country. The military has been restoring to indiscriminate bombing to bring things under control. According to the United Nations, 17.6 million people, which is roughly a third of Myanmar's population, will need humanitarian assistance. Now, this is not helping anyone's cause. Therefore, the author suggests a meaningful dialogue between the janta and the opposition to restore democracy. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now, taking this as an opportunity, let us revise about India-Myanmar relations. Now, before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here. You can just go through it. See, India and Myanmar relations are rooted in shared historical, ethnic, cultural and religious ties. India and Myanmar share a long land border of over 1600 km and a maritime boundary in the Bay of Bengal. Notably, four northeastern states that is Arunachal Pradesh, Nahaland, Manipur and Mizoram share border with Myanmar. Also, a large population of Indian origin live in Myanmar. Besides this, India and Myanmar had signed a treaty of friendship in 1951. This laid the foundation for a stronger relationship between India and Myanmar. Now, we'll understand the significance of this relation. See, Myanmar is the only Asian country adjoining India and therefore our gateway to Southeast Asia. We know that India is seeking greater economic integration with Southeast Asia through the Act East policy, right? So Myanmar is a bridge between India and ASEAN. To put it in simple words, while Myanmar is India's gateway to Southeast Asia, India is Myanmar's gateway to South Asia. 
then from the point of regional stability see india and myanmar border poses a challenge to india's security there has been a greater influx of rohingya refugees from myanmar's rakhine state into india this may cause stress in the border states so the help of myanmar's government is needed for us in this respect then india did not take a hard line approach on the myanmar's military in the rohingya issue and kept its distance when myanmar was hauled into the international court of justice over acquisition of rohingya genocide now this is also done in consideration of the strategic importance of myanmar to india besides all this there is another aspect to why myanmar is significant to us it is none other than china see china has increasing its influence and is using myanmar for gas minerals rubber and gemstones china is also accessing myanmar's naval ports to increase its presence in the indian ocean to encircle india so to counter this a strong relation with myanmar is significant for india also india's economic engagement with myanmar lags behind china so there is an urgent need for india to scale up economic ties with myanmar so far we saw about the significance of the india myanmar relationship and we saw about the regional stability now we'll see what are the areas of cooperation between the two countries see many infrastructure projects are underway this includes the india myanmar thailand trilateral highway and the kaladan multimodal transit which aims to connect the kolkata port with the sitwe deep water port in myanmar's rakhine state by sea see as part of its sahar policy here sahar means security and growth for all in the region so as part of its sahar policy it is india that developed the sitwe port in myanmar's rakhine state the kaladan multimodal transit project will connect southwest myanmar to northeast india the project would create a multimodal transit through sea river and road transport corridor to boost interconnectivity india's long term strategic goal is to create a special economic zone surrounding the sitwe port if this has been done india would boost its presence in the bay of bengal also the sitwe port is meant to be india's answer to the chinese fronted kyakpyu port Then secondly in the line of security cooperation India and Myanmar armies have carried out two joint military operations they are code named as operation sunshine 1 and 2 this is to fight militants along the borders of Myanmar's Rakhine state which borders the northeastern indian states apart from this there are military exercises like the india myanmar bilateral army exercise in short called as imbax it is aimed at building and promoting closer relations with armies further to deepen the defense relations india and myanmar signed a landmark defense cooperation agreement in july 2019 besides these india has identified myanmar as key to increasing its military exports so along that line myanmar bought india's first locally procured anti submarine torpedo called tal shena in 2017 and in 2019 myanmar acquired a diesel electric kilo class submarine ins sindhuvir then along the cultural lines the buddhist circuit initiative seeks to double foreign tourist arrivals and revenue by connecting ancient buddhist heritage sites across different states in india this is also aimed at the buddhist majority myanmar Apart from this bilateral trade has grown from 12.4 million dollar in 1980 to 81 to 2.18 billion dollar in 2016 to 17 Myanmar is also the beneficiary of a duty free tariff preference scheme for least developed countries LDCs then some of the indian companies like SR Gale and ONGC Videsh Limited have invested in Myanmar's energy sector Then cooperation in the banking sector the United Bank of India and Exim Bank have representative offices in Myanmar so these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about India Myanmar relations now recognizing its significance India Myanmar relations have to be prioritized by both countries and bilateral commitments should be translated to practical outcomes
this would help india to augment its standing as a regional power in the india pacific okay so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion according to the news article the finance minister of kerala while announcing the state budget said that india innovation center for graphene which is being set up in trishur kerala will become operational by september this year he also said that kerala digital university has signed a mou with saigen university germany for research and development activities related to the graphene ecosystem so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn about graphene and what is this india innovation center for graphene so what is a graphene graphene is a single layer of carbon atoms which are tightly bounded in a hexagonal honeycomb lattice now look at this image here this is the bonding structure of graphene which is looking like a honeycomb right remember graphene is an allotrope of carbon and it is the building block of graphite that is the layers of graphene are piled on top of each other to form graphite graphene is the most electrically and thermally conducting material in the world this means that graphene is the best conductor of heat at room temperature and also the best conductor of electricity know that graphene is also flexible transparent and incredibly strong it is said that graphene is 200 times stronger than steel and it is 1000 times lighter than paper with 98 percentage transparency apart from this graphene is also considered to be the world's first 2d material and it is said to be 1 million times thinner than the diameter of a single human hair graphene is also known as a wonder material because of its vast potential in the energy and medical world so with this basic understanding let us move on to see about india innovation center for graphene see in february 2022 the kerala government announced to set up india innovation center for graphene it is the country's first graphene innovation center which is being constructed in thrissur kerala it is a joint venture of digital university of kerala center for materials for electronic technology and tata steel limited so what is the significance of this center the first significance is that the graphene innovation center would boost the industry sector in the southern states it would encourage new startups which in turn the startups could leverage the advanced properties of graphene to innovate new products and services the second significance is that the innovation center would attract internationally leading research on graphene into india it would also bridge the gap between scientific development and industrial applications of graphene in our country and finally through the center the existing industrial organizations could also enhance the quality of their products and services by exploring the possibilities of using graphene in their production process so that's all you have to know about this news article discussion see in this news article discussion we saw in detail about what is graphene and we saw about the significance of the india innovation center for graphene so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Take a look at this news article it says that India would showcase the success stories of rural and archaeological tourism during the first tourism working group meeting of the G20 nations this is to be held at the Ranav Kutch in Gujarat basically the idea is to present rural tourism as a means of community empowerment and poverty elevation the article says that the Latpura Khas village of Madhya Pradesh Kunama village of Nagaland and heritage sites like dolabira will be showcased at this event here note that latpura khas was nominated as the best rural tourism village by the un wto that is world tourism organization it is also said that the success of developing many rural tourism products in and around ranav kutch will also be presented during this event so in this context we will use this opportunity to learn few facts about ranav kutch See the Ran of Kutch is a salty marshy land in the Thar desert in the Kutch district of western Gujarat. It lies between Gujarat in India and the Sindh province in Pakistan. The Ran of Kutch is known to be the largest salt desert in the world. The Hindi word ran means desert. This ran extended about 300 km from east to west and 150 km from north to south. The Ran of Kutch comprises a unique example of Holocene sedimentation. 
Also note that the Ran of Kutch is connected to the Arabian Sea through Kori Creek in the west and the Gulf of Kutch in the east. So what is this Gulf of Kutch? We know that a gulf is a portion of the ocean that penetrates land, right? So basically the Gulf of Kutch is an inlet of the Arabian Sea along the west coast of India. It actually divides Kutch and the Kathiawar Peninsula regions of Gujarat as you can see in this image. It actually comprises three landscapes. They include the Great Ran of Kutch, the Little Ran of Kutch and the Bani grassland. The Great Ran is in the north and the Little Ran is in the southeast as you can see in this image. These two are separated by the highland of Kutch. Then the Bani grasslands. This grassland in Gujarat's Kutch district is one of the largest grasslands in the Indian subcontinent. The Bani grasslands was declared a protected forest in 1955 under the Indian Forest Act 1927. There has been numerous natural wetlands in Bani and the largest one is known as Chari Danth which was recently declared as conservation reserve. This land has been populated since the Bronze Age. We all know about the Indus Valley Civilization, right? So these people of IVC had many settlements in the Ran of Kutch. Tolavera is the largest Indus Valley site in the region. Now talking about its ecology, the Ran of Kutch region is also home to a range of wildlife like the flamingos and the wild ass that can be spotted around the desert often. It also makes up part of sanctuaries like the Indian Wild Ass Sanctuary, Kutch Desert Wildlife Sanctuary, etc. Spinny tailed lizard, hyena, and antelope species like Nilgai and Chinkara are found in the Kutch Desert Wildlife Sanctuary. Make note of all these points since G20 is always in news. There might be a question in preliminary examination. So, kindly make note of these facts. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. According to the news article, the Tamil Nadu state government has informed the National Green Tribunal that the Penn Memorial proposed for former Chief Minister M. Karnanidhi will be built only after obtaining all necessary clearances and permissions from various authorities. This includes permissions from the National Coastal Zone Management Authority and the Union Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn few facts about the National Green Tribunal from the prelims perspective. See, the National Green Tribunal or NGT was established in the year 2010 under the National Green Tribunal Act 2010. So we can say that NGT is a statutory body. NGT is a specialized body equipped with the necessary expertise to handle environmental disputes involving multidisciplinary issues. Know that NGT shall not be bounded by the procedure laid down under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 but it shall be guided by principles of natural justice. So what is the reason behind the creation of NGT? See NGT was established for effective and expeditious disposal of cases related to environmental protection, conservation of forest and other natural resources. Now talking about NGT's location. NGT has its presence in five zones. They are North, Central, East, South and West zones. The principal bench is situated in the North zone which is headquartered in Delhi. The Central zone bench is situated in Bhopal. Then the East zone in Kolkata. Then South zone in Chennai and West zone in Pune. Now talking about the composition of the NGT. The NGT is headed by the chairman who sits in the principal bench. The chairman shall be the one who is or has been a judge of the Supreme Court or Chief Justice of the High Court. Then the tribunal should have at least 10 judicial members, but the judicial members should not exceed 20. Here the qualification of the judicial member is that that person should be or has been a judge of the High Court. Apart from the judicial members, the tribunal also has at least 10 expert members here also the expert members should not exceed 20. Remember the expert members should possess experience and qualification in the technological and scientific field or practical experience in matters related to the environment. Now talking about the appointment, the chairperson, judicial members and expert members of tribunal shall be appointed by the central government. 
the chairperson shall be appointed by the central government after consulting the chief justice of india now talking about the functioning of ngt firstly the tribunal has jurisdiction over all civil cases involving a substantial question related to the environment secondly the tribunal is vested with the powers for the enforcement of any legal right relating to the environment thirdly the ngt can order the concerned parties to provide relief and compensation for damages to persons and property apart from this if a person seeking relief and compensation for environmental damage which involves subjects in the legislations that are mentioned in schedule 1 of the national green tribunal act 2010 they may approach the national green tribunal now the legislations mentioned in the schedule 1 of the ngt act 2010 are given here for your reference you can go through it so these are all some of the important points that you have to note about ngt so in this news article discussion we saw about ngt the reason for its establishment then where it is located then we saw about the composition and qualification of the members finally we saw about the functioning of ngt so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article the news is that the madras high court has initiated so moto contempt of court proceedings against great chennai corporation zonal officer for commenting in open court he commented that an additional advocate general has scored a same side goal this happened when the law officer fairly conceded that the rules had not been followed in a tender notification issued by the officer so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about contempt of court in exam perspective so first of all what is contempt of court see when someone is said to be in contempt of court then he or she has disrespected the court's order or lowered the authority of the court the objective behind the concept of contempt of court is to safeguard the interest of the public because if the authority of the court is lowered then public confidence in the administration of justice will be weakened or eroded this might result in the collapse of the entire judicial system so the concept of contempt of court is necessary for the judiciary to function smoothly now remember the contempt of court can be of two types one is civil contempt and other is criminal contempt first let us take civil contempt a civil contempt means willful disobedience to any judgment decree direction order writ or other process of a court or willful breach of an undertaking given to a court so this is about civil contempt now moving on to criminal contempt see a criminal contempt means the publication of any matter or doing any other act which scandalizes the court or lowers the authority of any court here the term scandalizing the court refers to something that brings the authority administration or law by the court into disrepute or creates distrust and disbelief in the minds of the public at large okay a criminal contempt case also includes the publication of any matter which infers with the due course of any judicial proceedings or obstructs the administration of justice in any other manner here the publication could be by words spoken or written or by signs or by visible representations so basically the difference between civil and criminal contempt is that in case of civil contempt the order of the court is not followed and in case of the criminal contempt the authority of the court is lowered so i hope you could understand what is contempt of court and what are the two types of contempt of court so these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the new article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this first question this question is about contempt of court first statement it is well defined in the constitution of india see statement 1 is incorrect because the constitution of india does not define the term contempt of court the constitution only empowers the high court and the supreme court to punish the contempt apart from this the contempt of court act 1971 only defines the contempt of court okay so this statement is incorrect now look at the second statement article 129 of the constitution empowers the supreme court to punish for any contempt of itself see this statement is actually correct article 129 declares the supreme court as a court of record and the supreme court shall have all the powers of a court of record including the power to punish for its contempt of itself okay now the third statement 
Article 215 of the Constitution empowers the High Court to punish for any contempt of itself. This statement is also correct. Article 215 declares High Court as a court of record and the High Court shall have all the powers of such a court including the powers to punish for contempt for itself. So the correct answer for the question is option B 2 and 3 only. Now this question is about NGT. Statement 1 the NGT has been established by an act whereas the CPCB has been created by the executive order of the government. See this statement is actually incorrect. From our discussion we know that the National Green Tribunal was established under the National Green Tribunal Act 2010. Like this the Central Pollution Control Board was also established under the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. So both are statutory bodies hence first statement is incorrect. Now look at the second statement, the NGT provides environmental justice and helps reduce the burden of litigation in the higher courts whereas the CPCB promotes cleanliness of streams and wells and aims to improve the quality of air in the country. See actually this statement is correct. Since the statement itself is self-explanatory, we can say that the correct answer for the question is option B to only. Okay. Now moving on to the quiz question of the day. This question about ran of Kutch is the quiz question for you today. Try to solve the question and post the correct answer in the comment section. So displayed here are the main practice questions for you today. Quite a lot of questions but still if you keep on practicing only you can score better right. So just try to write an answer and post it in the comment section. So with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Now thank you for listening.